Part Thirteen of the Book of the National Parks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Book of the National Parks by Robert Sterling Yard. Mount Rainier, Icy Octopus. Continued. Three. Our four volcanic national parks exemplify four states of volcanic history. Lassen Peak is semi-active. Mount Rainier is dormant. Yellowstone is dead and Crater Lake marks the spot through which a volcano collapsed and disappeared. Rainier's usefulness as a volcanic example, however, is lost in its supreme usefulness as a glacial exhibit. The student of glaciers, who begins here with the glacier in action, and then studies the effects of glaciers upon igneous rocks among the cirques of the Sierra, and upon sedimentary rocks in the Glacier National Park, will study the masters, which, by the way, is a tip for universities contemplating summer field classes upon the truncated top of mount rainier nearly three miles in diameter rise two small cinder cones which form at the junction of their craters the mountain's rounded snow-covered summit it is known as columbia crest as this only rises four hundred feet above the older containing crater it is not always identified from below as the highest point two commanding rocky elevations of the old rim point success on its southwest side fourteen thousand one hundred fifty feet and liberty cap on its northwest side fourteen thousand one hundred twelve feet appear to be from the mountain's foot its points of greatest altitude rainier's top though covered with snow and ice except in spots bared by internal heat is not the source of its glaciers although its extensive ice fields flow into and feed several of them the glaciers themselves even those continuous with the summit ice really originate about four thousand feet below the top in cirques or pockets which are principally fed with the tremendous snows of winter and the wind sweepings and avalanches from the summit the pacific winds are charged heavily with moisture which descends upon rainier in snows of great depth even paradise park is snowed under from twelve to thirty feet there is a photograph of a ranger cabin in february which shows only a slight snow mound with a hole in its top which locates the hidden chimney. F. E. Mathis, the geologist, tells of a snow level of fifty feet depth in Indian Henry's hunting ground, one of Rainier's most beautiful parks, in which the wind had sunk a crater-like hollow from the bottom of which emerged a chimney. These snows replenish the glaciers, which have a combined surface of forty-five square miles, along their entire length, in addition to making enormous accumulations in the cirques. Beginning then in its cirque, as a river often begins in its lake, the glacier flows downward, river-like, along a course of least resistance. Here it pours over a precipice in broken falls to flatten out in perfect texture in the even stretch below. Here it plunges down rapids, breaking into crevasses as the river in corresponding phase breaks into ripples. Here it rises smoothly over rocks upon its bottom. Here it strikes against a wall of rock and turns sharply. The parallel between the glacier and the river is striking and consistent, notwithstanding that the geologist, for technical reasons, will quarrel with you if you picturesquely call your glacier a river of ice. Any elevated viewpoint will disclose several or many of these mighty streams flowing in snake-like curves down the mountainside, the greater streams swollen here and there by tributaries as rivers are swollen by entering creeks and all eventually reach a point, determined by temperature and therefore not constant, where the river of ice becomes the river of water. Beginning white and pure, the glacier gradually clothes itself in rock and dirt, gathering as it moves narrow edges of matter filched from the shores. Later on it heaps these up upon its lower banks. They are lateral moraines. Two merging glaciers unite the material carried on their joined edges and form a medial moraine, a ribbon broadening and thickening as it descends a glacier made up of several tributaries carries as many medial moraines it also carries much unorganized matter fallen from the cliffs or scraped from the bottom approaching the snout all these accumulations merge into one moraine and so soiled has the ice now become that it is difficult to tell which is ice and which is rock at its snout is an ice cave far inside of which the resultant river originates but the glacier has one very important function which the river does not share. Far up at its beginnings, it freezes to the back wall of its cirque, and, moving forward, pulls out, or plucks out, as the geologists have it, 
masses of rock which it carries away in its current. The resulting cavities in the back of the cirque fill with ice, which in its turn freezes fast and plucks out more rock, and presently the back wall of the cirque, undermined, falls on the ice and is also carried away. There is left a precipice, often surely perpendicular, and as the process repeats itself, this precipice moves backward. At the beginning of this process, it must be understood, the glacier lies upon a tilted surface far more elevated than now when you see it in its old age, sunk deep in its self-dubbed trench, and while it is plucking backward and breaking off an ever-increasing precipice above it, it is plucking downward, too. If the rock is even in structure, this downward cutting may be very nearly perpendicular. But if the rock lies in strata of varying hardness, shelves form where the harder strata are encountered, because it takes longer to cut them through. In this way are formed the long series of steps which we often see in empty glacial cirques. By this process of backward and downward plucking, the carbon glacier bit its way into the north side of the great volcano until it invaded the very foundations of the summit and created the Willis Wall, which drops avalanches 3,600 feet to the glacier below. Willis Wall is nearly perpendicular, because the lava rock at this point was homogeneous. But in the alternating shale and limestone strata of Glacier National Park, on the other hand, the glaciers of old dug cirques of many shelves. The monster ice streams which dug glaciers' mighty valleys have vanished, but often tiny remainders are still seen upon the cirques' topmost shelves. So we see that the glacier acquires its cargo of rock not only by scraping its sides and plucking it from the bottom of its cirque and valley, but by quarrying backward till undermined material drops upon it. All of this in fulfillment of nature's purpose of wearing down the highlands for the upbuilding of the hollows. This is not the place for a detailed description of Mount Rainier's twenty-eight glaciers. A glance at the map will tell something of the story. Extending northeasterly from the summit will be seen the greatest unbroken glacial mass. Here are the Emmons and the Winthrop glaciers, much the largest of all. This is the quarter farthest from the sun, upon which its rays strike at the flattest angle. The melting, then, is least here. But still a more potent reason for their larger mass is found in their position on the lee quarter of the peak, the prevailing winds whirling in the snow from both sides. The greater diversification of the other sides of the mountain, with extruding cliffs, cleavers, and enormous rock masses, tends strongly to scenic variety and grandeur. Some of the rock cleavers which divide glaciers stand several thousand feet in height, veritable fences. Some of the cliffs would be mountains of no mean size elsewhere, and around their sides pour mighty glacial currents, cascading to the depths below, where again they may meet and even merge. The Nisqually Glacier naturally is the most celebrated, not because of scenic superiority, but because it is the neighbor and the playground of the visiting thousands. Its perfect and wonderful beauty are not in excess of many others, and it is much smaller than many. The Cowlitz Glacier nearby exceeds it in size, and is one of the stateliest. It springs from a cirque below Gibraltar, a massive near-summit rock, whose well-deserved celebrity is due in some part to its nearness to the traveled summit trail. The point I am making is not in depreciation of any of the celebrated sites from the southern side, but in emphasis of the fact that a hundred other sites would be as celebrated, or more celebrated, were they as well known. The Mount Rainier National Park at this writing is replete with splendors which are yet to be discovered by the greater traveling public. The Great North Side, for instance, with its mighty walls, its magnificently scenic glaciers, its lakes, canyons, and enormous areas of flowered and forested pleasure grounds, is destined to wide development. It is a national park in itself. Already roads enter to camps at the foot of great glaciers. The West Side also, with its four spectacular glaciers, which pass under the names of Mowich and Tahoma, attain sublimity, it remains also for future occupation. Many of the minor phenomena, while common also to other areas of snow and ice, have fascination for the visitor. Snow cups are always objects of interest and beauty. Instead of reducing a snow surface evenly, the warm sun sometimes melts it in patterned cups set close together like the squares of a checkerboard. These deepen gradually till they suggest a gigantic honeycomb, whose sails are sometimes several feet deep. In one of these, one summer day in the Sierra, I saw a stumbling horse deposit his rider, 
a high official of one of our western railroads, and there he sat helpless, hands and feet emerging from the top, while we recovered enough from laughter to help him out. Pink snow always arouses lively interest. A microscopic plant, Protococcus novalis, growing in occasional patches beneath the surface of old snow, gradually emerges with a pink glow which sometimes covers acres. On the tongue its flavor suggests watermelon. No doubt many other microscopic plants thrive in the snowfields and glaciers, which remain invisible for lack of color. Insects also inhabit these glaciers. There are several Thrysonura, which suggest the sand fleas of our seashores, but are seldom noticed because of their small size. More noticeable are the Mesenchytrius, a slender brown worm which attains the length of an inch. They may be seen in great numbers on the lower glaciers in the summer, but on warm days retreat well under the surface. 4. The extraordinary forest luxuriance at the base of Mount Rainier is due to moisture and climate. The same heavy snowfalls which feed the glaciers store up water supplies for the forest and meadow. The winters at the base of the mountain are mild. The lower valleys are covered with a dense growth of fir, hemlock, and cedar. Pushing skyward in competition for the sunlight, trees attain great heights. Protected from winter's severity by the thickness of the growth, and from fire by the dampness of the soil, great age is assured, which means thick and heavy trunks. The Douglas fir, easily the most important timber tree of western America, here reaches its two hundred feet in massive forests, while occasional individuals grow two hundred and fifty to two hundred and seventy-five feet, with a diameter of eight feet. The bark at the base of these monsters is sometimes ten inches thick. The western hemlock also reaches equal heights in competition for the light, with diameters of five feet or more. Red cedar, white pines of several varieties, several firs, and a variety of hemlocks complete the list of conifers. Deciduous trees are few and not important. Broad-leafed maples, cottonwoods, and alders are the principal species. Higher up the mountain slopes, the forests thin and lessen in size, while increasing in picturesqueness. The Douglas fir and other monsters of the lower levels disappear. Their place is taken by other species. At an altitude of 4,000 feet, the Engelmann spruce and other mountain trees begin to appear, not in the massed ranks of the lower levels, but in groves bordering the flowered opens. The extreme limit of tree growth on Mount Rainier is about 7,000 feet of altitude, above which one finds only occasional, distorted, wind-tortured mountain hemlocks. There is no well-defined timberline, as on other lofty mountains. Avalanches and snowslides keep the upper levels swept and bare. The wild flower catalog is too long to enumerate here. John Muir expresses the belief that no other subalpine floral gardens excel Rainier's in profusion and gorgeousness. The region differs little from other Pacific regions of similar altitude in variety of species. In luxuriance, it is unsurpassed. 5. According to Theodore Winthrop, who visited the Northwest in 1853 and published a book entitled The Canoe and the Saddle, which had wide vogue at the time and is consulted today, Mount Rainier had its Indian Rip Van Winkle. The story was told in great detail by Hammett Chu, a frowsy ancient of the Squaliamish. The hero was a wise and wily fisherman and hunter. Also, as his passion was gain, he became an excellent businessman. He always had salmon and berries when food became scarce and prices high. Gradually he amassed large savings in Hiaqua, the little perforated shell which was the most valued form of wampum, the Indian's money. The richer he got, the stronger his passion grew for Hiaqua, and when a spirit told him in a dream of vast hordes at the summit of Rainier, he determined to climb the mountain. The spirit was Tamanoas, which, Winthrop explains, is the vague Indian personification of the supernatural. So he threaded the forest and climbed the mountain's glistening side. At the summit he looked over the rim into a large basin in the bottom of which was a black lake surrounded by purple rock. At the lake's eastern end stood three monuments. The first was as tall as a man, and had a head carved like a salmon. The second was the image of a camas bulb. The two represented the great necessities of Indian life. The third was a stone elk's head, with the antlers in velvet. At the foot of this monument he dug a hole. Suddenly a noise behind him caused him to turn. An otter clambered over the edge of the lake and struck the snow with its tail. Eleven others followed. 
each was twice as big as any otter he had ever seen their chief was four times as big the eleven sat themselves in a circle around him and the leader climbed upon the stone elkhead at first the treasure seeker was abashed but he had come to find hiaqua and he went on digging at every thirteenth stroke the leader of the otters tapped stone elk with his tail and the eleven followers tapped the snow with their tails once they all gathered closer and whacked the digger good and hard with their tails but though astonished and badly bruised he went on working presently he broke his elkhorn pick but the biggest otter seized another in his teeth and handed it to him finally his pick struck a flat rock with a hollow sound and the otters all drew near and gazed into the hole breathing excitedly he lifted the rock and under it found a cavity filled to the brim with pure white hiaqua every shell large unbroken and beautiful all were neatly hung on strings never was treasure quest so successful the otters recognizing him as the favorite of tamanoos retired to a distance and gazed upon him respectfully but the miser writes the narrator never dreamed of gratitude never thought to hang a string from the buried treasure about the salmon and camas tamanoos stones and two strings around the elk's head no all must be his own all he could carry now and the rest for the future greedily he loaded himself with the booty and laboriously climbed to the rim of the bowl prepared for the descent of the mountain the otters puffing in concert plunged again into the lake which at once disappeared under a black cloud straightway a terrible storm arose through which the voice of tamanuas screamed tauntingly blackness closed around him the din was horrible terrified he threw back into the bowl behind him five strings of hiaqua to propitiate tamanuus and there followed a momentary lull during which he started homeward but immediately the storm burst again with roaring like ten thousand bears nothing could be done but to throw back more hiaqua following each sacrifice came another lull followed in turn by more terrible outbreaks and so string by string he parted with all his gains then he sank to the ground insensible when he awoke he lay under an arbutus tree in a meadow of camas he was shockingly stiff and every movement pained him but he managed to gather and smoke some dry arbutus leaves and eat a few camas bulbs he was astonished to find his hair very long and matted and himself bent and feeble tamanuus he muttered nevertheless he was calm and happy Strangely, he did not regret his lost strings of hiaqua. Fear was gone, and his heart was filled with love. Slowly and painfully he made his way home. Everything was strangely altered. Ancient trees grew where shrubs had grown four days before. Cedars, under whose shade he used to sleep, lay rotting on the ground. Where his lodge had stood, now he saw a new and handsome lodge, and presently out of it came a very old, decrepit squaw, who, nevertheless, through her wrinkles, had a look that seemed strangely familiar to him her shoulders were hung thick with hiaqua strings she bent over a pot of boiling salmon and crooned my old man has gone 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 my old man to tacoma has gone to hunt the elk he went long ago when will he come down 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 to salmon pot and me he has come down quavered the returned traveller at last recognizing his wife he asked no questions Charging it all to the wrath of Tamanous, he accepted fate as he found it. After all, it was a happy fate enough in the end, for the old man became the great medicine man of his tribe, by whom he was greatly revered. The name of this Rip Van Winkle of Mount Rainier is not mentioned in Mr. Winthrop's narrative. End of Part 13